a white police officer in a place called Watts, Los Angeles, killed a black person and the city exploded in what they call a riot or a rebellion. And Dr. King went out to Los Angeles, and y'all can find this on YouTube. Dr. King is sitting there in this YouTube clip, and there's angry young black folks saying, get out of here, Dr. King. We don't want to hear that nonviolent stuff. And to his credit, unlike a lot of leaders, he sat there and he took it, he took the criticism, he, he listened to their anger, and one of his most famous quotes came out of that period when he said, a riot is the language of the unheard. I want to thank God for this opportunity. Um, uh, this is not a religious speech, but it's the way I was raised, and, um, and I don't assume everyone is um, Christian. If you're Jewish, if you're Muslim, if you're agnostic or atheistic, you have that right as well. I hope we all could disagree, especially given all that's happening in the country, that we're all part of the human family, one race. Can we agree to that at least? Is that cool? Because these are deep times that we're living in. Uh, this is a beautiful library, and it's good to be here as a New Yorker. As a New Yorker, uh, I got off the train and I saw Patriot stuff everywhere. And I, good luck to y'all on Sunday. <laughs> yes, we are jealous in New York about a few things. You know, I will say that. Um, but good luck. And I just want to uh, get into this topic because this is so important to me. Uh, and I'm so glad that um, the Boston Public Library has dedicated this year, this lecture series, to, to social justice and social resilience. Um, there's a lot to say. Over the last, uh, it's February 1st. It is February 1st. Oh my gosh. It's February. Over the last month, um, I literally have been in Missouri, Virginia, Kansas, Texas, and a few other states that I can't remember right now. And what's been interesting to me, and I meant to post this on social media earlier today, Usually in the past, uh, the Dr. King celebration or even the uh, evoking his name would be that day or a couple of days before, a couple of days after. But I literally have programs that have Dr. King's name in it in the first two months of this year. And it says to me that people are looking for some solutions. People are looking back to figure out what was going on back then that we can use now. And I do believe that people really understand that, that what Dr. King was saying, particularly at the end of his life, is very necessary, that we need a radical revolution of values. Are you with me out there? You know, and I, I just want to um, I want to get into this topic, looking for Martin, Dr. King, community, civil rights, social media, and the new activism. It's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. But I would, I would be remiss not to acknowledge the fact that since it is February, this is Black History Month. This is Black History Month, and this is the first day of Black History Month. And as I say everywhere I go, I assume that people who are in the spaces who are Americans who live in this country know that black history was created by a man named Carter G. Woodson, that he didn't get his high school diploma until he was in his early 20s, and that he actually uh, became one of the first people of color, black people, to, to graduate over in Cambridge from Harvard University. This man had a PhD. He wrote many scholarly articles. He wrote many books. His most famous book is The Miseducation of the Negro. And we know that he said famously in The Miseducation of the Negro that black people in this country, or women, or other people of color, or queer sisters and brothers, or disabled folks, people who have been marginalized in some way, left out of history, have been so conditioned to have an inferiority complex because they didn't see themselves in history that even if there was no back door, they'd go create the back door. And so that's one of the reasons why he created Negro History Week in 1926. And he picked February, uh, not because it was the shortest month, but because a couple of folks born in February were significant to black history and American history. Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, was born in February. Abraham Lincoln, as some of y'all who are over 30, 40 years, of, 40 years of age, remember when we were growing up, we would celebrate Washington's birthday and Lincoln's birthday in February, and they just kind of put it together as President's Day now. But Lincoln was born in February, and we know that you know, there's this belief that Lincoln freed the slaves. And it's a bit more complex than that, as y'all know, because sometimes Lincoln was for slavery, sometimes he was against slavery, and we know that Lincoln is, uh, is quoted as never believing that black folks were actually the intellectual equals of our white sisters and brothers. But still, he was significant to black history. And so that's why he picked February. And we know that over time, because of the civil rights movement, because of the work of Dr. King and Malcolm X and Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer, women and men, boys and girls, people of different backgrounds, by the 1970s, it became Black History Month. It's also February 1st, which is the birthday of my favorite writer ever, Langston Hughes, Langston Hughes, um, poet, essayist, fiction writer, novelist. He wrote autobiographies. He did translations. Uh, this man uh, was born in 1902, 
about 15 years ago, his centennial, his 100th birthday, I went to Lawrence, Kansas, where the University of Kansas is. Dr. Mary M. McGraham did a, a celebration lunch, and he used over 800 scholars from around the world, every culture, race, group that you can think of, showed up at the celebration of Langston Hughes. And so he was actually, his whole being was the epitome of bringing different types of people together, you know? And so I encourage folks, when we think about uh, uh, Dr. King and the whole concept of a dream, understand that 13 years before, about 13 years before Dr. King gave that famous I Have a Dream speech, one of Langston Hughes' most famous poems was called Harlem. And the first line is, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? You know? And so I think we, it's important for us to acknowledge that and also understand that black history is American history. Black history is American history. If you take away Phil Hollers, spirituals, blues, jazz, rock and roll, soul, hip hop, you know, you're taking away a huge chunk of American music. I'm a massive Beatles fan. I'm a massive fan of the British invasion. But who were those young white brothers and sisters studying over in the UK when they made their, the British invasion over here? They were studying the blues musicians of America, you know? And so when we talk about history, it's important that we don't let it get marginalized or ghettoized to one month, just like Women's History Month is next month. And we know that women are significant every single day of the year. And so part of the reason why Women's History Month exists and Black History Month exists because racism and sexism are alive in the world in this country and in this planet. But in spite of that, I have hope. I have hope because of seniors, elders that are out there, people like my mother who will turn 75 years old this year. You know, and I'm so clear I wouldn't be standing here, as I always say, if it wasn't for the sacrifices of my mother who has an eighth grade education. And I'm so clear. And let me ask people, please don't videotape this because WGBH is videotaping it. So if y'all can just get the video from them, I'd appreciate it. They, they're officially doing it and they're live streaming it. Is that cool? Is that all right? Appreciate y'all. Um, but my mother and all the elders, and I think about that because my mother actually turned 20 years of age on August 28, 1963, the same day that Dr. King gave the I Have a Dream speech. They give me hope, the elders, the elders, the elders. We'll never want to get some wisdom at this point. And I'll be honest with you, me and my mother have had a difficult relationship through the years, but I listen to her more than ever. And I don't take for granted that she's still here with us. And I ask her simple questions about Donald Trump, your president, not mine, and other things. And you know, it's profound what she's saying because she's lived through Jim Crow and segregation. She's lived through all the changes. She lived through her son going to being the first wave of kids going to integrated schools, and for her to see all of this racism come back again in its most ugly, the ugliest forms, you know, I mean, it's profound. What gives me hope? Young people give me hope. Young people of all backgrounds. I love young people. Uh, I was at a program earlier this week where a, a professor got up at a college, I won't say the college, and he did what a lot of people who are older do. Young people are sitting in the audience, millennials, and they proceeded, he proceeded to diss young people like they weren't even there. You know, they, 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 and they're not woke enough, and they're not doing enough, and why are they always on Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram? And I just said, you know, I hear you, but I'm not gonna participate in what we call generational dissing because Dr. King was only 26 when he led the Montgomery bus boycott, so if he was alive in these times, he'd be a millennial. Y'all with me? And we seem to forget that young people of every generation, any movement that we've seen in this country around the world have been at the forefront of change. There's energy, there's idealism, there's all kinds of stuff going on. You know, I just saw that Hugh Masekela, the great South African musician, died a couple of days ago. Well, I was a young person in the 1980s at Rutgers University when I learned about the anti-apartheid movement. It was young people on college campuses like Rutgers, at Harvard, all around this country, who stopped our universities from investing in businesses that supported the apartheid regime and people like Nelson Mandela being in jail. Young people. Are y'all with me out there? And so that gives me hope. My own family history gives me hope. As I said, you know, um, I'm actually, I just published my 13th, I just finished my 13th book. It'll be out in the fall. And it's a, the subtitle is An Autobiography of America, but I don't take for granted what gives me hope. My mama, as I said, has an eighth grade education. My grandmother could not read or write. And so I'm like, man, I can see the progress within my own family history. I'm a first generation college student. We gotta take pride in those small victories. What gives me hope? Hashtag me too gives me hope. Hashtag me too gives me hope. Hashtag me too gives me hope, just like Black Lives Matter gives me hope. 
Why do I say that? Because I know, including my mother, as I say in my new book, she faced sexual harassment when she was a young woman. You know, when, you, when I read the story about Harvey Weinstein coming out of his room in a robe, I'm like, my mother told me that story when I was a little boy about how she was working as the help for a wealthy white family in Westchester, New York, and when no one else was there but the husband, the father, who comes out but the father, and he has a robe on, he sits there, and he opens up his legs, there's nothing in between that. I don't even know how my mother got out of that situation. You know? But she did. So hashtag me too, which was created by a black woman named Toronto Burke, a good friend of mine from New York City, you know, one out of four women on the, uh, and girls on this, in this country, one out of three on the planet would face some form of sexual violence. Hashtag me too, my wife, who I just married, and her, her uncle was here, and, and Mr. Park was here. She has a show called She, a choreo play. She, a choreo play that she conceived of two years ago about women and girls who are survivors of some sort, form of, 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 of gender violence. Little did she know when she started developing this show, which was inspired by Itazaki Shange's For Colored Girls, which, which is inspired by even the, the, the Vagina Monologues, remixed for the 21st century, she had no idea that the women's marches, they'd be hashtag me too and hashtag time's up. You know, uh, black lives matter. Yeah, all lives do matter. I do believe we're all sisters and brothers, all part of the human family, but the reason why we say black lives matter, black lives matter, because clearly it doesn't matter to a lot of people in this country. You know? Uh, and so what we're saying is, hey, I should not be the guest speaker here, and then the moment I leave, I, I wonder if I might get killed tonight just because of who I am. Black lives matter. All black lives matter. What, what gives me hope? The dreamers, the dreamers, the dreamers, the issue of immigration. You know, uh, I, I, I support immigration. I think it's one of the major civil rights issues of these times, and I love the young people that I've encountered. I will tell y'all, I've worked with folks who are dreamers in New York City. Many of them are fearful of the fact that they can get kicked out of the country at any time. You know, there's one young man that I was going to hire to work with me a couple months ago, uh, and when he realized that I travel around the country, he's like, I don't want to go with you to Boston, I don't want to go with you to L.A. or anywhere else because I don't know if I'll get kicked out of the country by ICE. What's happening, though, that gives me hope is that a lot of these young people are courageous and fearless, and they're using something called social media. And to older folks who don't understand social media, if you're not on social media, you're missing it. You're missing it. You're missing it. You know, when I think about Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn alone, you're talking about hundreds of millions of people. And we got to stop acting as if people, you know, that, that they, they need to organize the way it was in the 60s and 70s. We learn from the 60s and 70s. I certainly believe that there's something powerful about people to people connection, but you don't dish the fact that some people feel empowered because social media is the most democratic thing that a lot of people have to just get their voices out there. Are y'all with me? So that's what's happening. But then by the, f the flip side of it, I feel that we have to be realistic about the fact that oh, it's been 50 years since Dr. King was killed, 50 years since Bobby Kennedy was killed, and wow, they both were killed by guns. We got over 300 million people in this country, and we got over 300 million guns in this country. Violence is alive and well. As I was coming here, I'm reading about the third school shooting just in the past few weeks out in LA. You know, it's not just even adults now committing mass shooting, it's young people, kids doing it. Where are they getting the guns from? Why is it so easy to get? You know? When we talk about where we are now, how many of y'all, by a show of hands, watched or listened to, if you could stomach it, the State of the Union address the other day? I had to, because I think it's important for us to, if we're going to change anything, you got to know what's going on. And the two things bothered me greatly, the way that the President of the United States conveniently used people of color over and over again as props, you know, uh, to show that he is somehow inclusive. I covered as a journalist the Republican National Convention in 2016. I'm keeping it, uh, keeping it real with y'all. There were barely any people of color there except for the folks who were cleaning up this, the arena. That was it. So I'm looking at this, let's roll out this family, let's roll out that family, you know? And then on top of that, the way he talked about immigrants as if they were criminals, as if they had no morality whatsoever, I'm saying to myself, as, a, as, a, as someone who knows American history, as an American, you know, at one point in our history, that's how we talked about Jewish people. That's how we talked about Chinese people. That's how we talked about Japanese people. That's how we've talked about Germans and Irish and Italian people. That's how we talked about Native Americans. That's how we've talked about black people. Every generation, every era, we find someone to scapegoat. Are y'all with me out there? And I'm listening to this speech, and I'm saying, this is, this is, Coded language, because they can't just come out and say, we hate you. 
but they're essentially saying, we hate you and we blame you for everything. But it's not just him, and we gotta stop acting as if, in the spirit of Dr. King, that this is somehow new, because racism is not new. This country was founded on racism and sexism and classism. Donald Trump's the president of the United States now, but 100 years ago, there was a man named Woodrow Wilson who was the president of the United States. And one of the first things that he did when he got into the White House, this person, this gentleman who had been the president of Princeton University, was to resegregate federal agencies in Washington, D.C. Well, what else did he do? He invited into the White House a movie called Birth of a Nation, The Birth of a Nation, which is one of the most racist films ever created. In fact, he's quoted about two or three times in the film because I had the opportunity maybe about six months ago to go to the Library of Congress and get a personal tour from some of the librarians there and they took me to the Woodrow Wilson room and one thing that I noticed that a lot of the books that Woodrow Wilson was collecting were books that were rooted in white supremacy. Y'all with me? And so I'm saying to you all, we, only those of us who are shocked in 2018 about racism are people who either have forgotten or don't know basic history. It's always been there. It's always been there. It's always been there. If we're still, you know, and I give the Cleveland baseball team credit, the fact that they said we're gonna change our logo finally from that disrespectful image of a Native American, if we're still having these conversations in 2018, 2019, that says we've got a long way to go. We're still teaching people that Columbus discovered America when we know that he and other explorers created mass genocide against indigenous people that we call Indians. The word Massachusetts is a Native American word. Well, who was here first? And what happened to them? Where are they? You know? Racism is not even understanding that when we turn people away, you know, from this country, we're saying that we don't want to help people. It may be Latinos and Asians today, but I saw something on Facebook the other day that just was really striking to me. I knew it, but to see the image of a little Jewish boy who was trying to immigrate during the era of Hitler to this country, and it was turned away, and then he dies in the Holocaust because we don't want those people here. Y'all know what I'm saying? Racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, there's hatred of the others. But as we said earlier, it's not just uh, uh, racism. This issue of sexism is real. Where are we at today as we talk about Dr. King? I mean, you know, I hear a lot of men saying they feel uncomfortable. They can't believe this is happening, all these people, you know? Sports, politics, entertainment industry, Hollywood. But the reality is, women still don't get equal pay for equal work. The reality is, where I live in New York City, I don't know how it is in Boston, most of the women that I know, including my wife, are not comfortable leaving, from the moment they leave their home to walk down the street, to get on the subway train, to go to work, wondering if someone is going to touch them or say something to them in a very disrespectful, inappropriate, and destructive, toxic way. Are y'all with me out there? You know? And just like I didn't learn black history growing up, I mean, what did we really learn about women? Betsy Ross sold a flag. We might have learned vaguely about Susan B. Anthony, Helen Keller, Rosa Parks, of course, because she served double duty, black history and women's history. <laughs> and I was an A student, K through 12, but that was the totality of the education I got about women and girls, and then I was off to college, and we wonder why rape culture is out of control on college campuses. Right? Did I always know this? No. I was challenged 25 years ago for my own destructive behavior, which I talk about in this memoir of mine, by women. Like Kevin Powell, how can you say you're about social justice? You're only talking about what's important to you, but you're ignoring half the country's population and half the world population. So I'm saying to the men out there, you know, as Ethan has said to me, as Gloria Steinem has said to me, as Bell Hooks has said to me, Sexism will not end until we men make it end. Doesn't matter if we're heterosexual, cisgendered men, or queer men. If you identify as a man, you benefit from male privilege, period. But it's not just sexism and racism, it's also 
something that Dr. King was talking about a lot about at the end of his life, class, class, class. If in 2018 we still use terms like poor white trash, trailer trash, rednecks, ghetto, hood, illegal aliens, which President Trump, the president, used several times in the State of the Union address, we're participating in classism. If we come to libraries or colleges and universities and we don't speak to the security guards, the secretaries, the folks who clean up, we're participating in classism. If we think we're better than people just because we got a BA or an MA or MFA or a PhD, we're the antithesis of what Dr. King represented because he had a PhD. At the end of his life, he's there with garbage men in Memphis, Tennessee, helping them. Are y'all with me out there? He never thought his class background, oh yeah, he never thought his class background made him better than anybody. And y'all know his quote, he said, every job has dignity, I'm paraphrasing it, but the part that stands out to me, even if you're a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper you can be. But a lot of us participate in classism. I come from poverty. Yes, I've got 13 books. Yes, I went to college. Yes, I got my own business. Yes, I've done a lot of stuff in my life. But I still see the world as the son of a single mother who was on welfare and food stamps and government cheese. And I had one pair of shoes and I had one pair of sneakers. And when I ran holes into my shoes or sneakers, there was no new shoes or sneakers. And I grew up on the East Coast just like y'all did, which means we put cardboard at the bottom of the shoes or sneakers. And I still had to go out to school. That's where I come from. That's where I come from, classism. But we can't stop there. You know, we seem to forget that Dr. King would not have been able to give that I have a dream speech if a queer black man named Bayard Rustin had not been the principal organizer on the March of Washington. But he was erased from history for a long time because he was a gay man. And I'm saying, hey, you know, Bayard Rustin, and who was a greater writer than another gay brother named James Baldwin, who, if you just read The Fire Next Time, short, tiny book, is probably the most significant writing about what the Civil Rights Movement was. And so when I hear people hate on people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, but then they talk about justice for other people or themselves, I'm saying you can't just be opposed to just injustice that's convenient for you. Or what did Dr. King say? An injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I thought about that as I was coming to the great state of Massachusetts, and I was reminded that the first transgender person that was killed this year was in the state of Massachusetts, the founder of Miss Trans America Beauty Contest. Y'all with me out there? So we got to think about these things. We also got to think about ableism, our disabled sisters and brothers, disabled human beings, because they are really invisible. You know what I'm saying? And so when I think about this beloved community that Dr. King was talking about, yeah, we've made progress. The fact that we can sit here civilly, people of different backgrounds, but as long as racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and ableism and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and classism and ageism, the way we disrespect and disregard elders, and boy, have I seen that a lot with my mother living in a senior building, how they talk to seniors. They don't do it to my mother because they know Kevin Powell don't play that, and he's an activist, and he's going to show up and say no. But the, the love community that we want to get to, we're not there yet. We're not there yet, but I got hope. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And so the question begs itself, sisters and brothers, fellow human beings, however you identify yourselves, you know, who was this Dr. King dude? Who was he? What I feel, what I've learned in these 20 plus years of traveling around the country, and I don't know everything, I, I know a little bit of something, but what's been striking to me is a lot of folks know that Dr. King led the Montgomery bus boycott. They know about the I Have a Dream speech. Some have actually even read the I Have a Dream speech in its entirety or listened to it and can repeat it verbatim. Not a lot of us, though, what I've seen around the country. And I've been to all 50 states in this country. Some of us then don't know anything between 1963 that I Have a Dream speech and 1968 when he was killed. Who was this man? And what I began to realize 
around my own ignorance around Dr. King is it's just no different than how we were told George Washington was the father of the country and he never told a lie and Lincoln freed the slaves. And it's almost like Washington was the first president, Lincoln was the 16th president. Well, who are all those folks in between them? Y'all know what I'm talking about? And so you begin to realize that we're talking about looking for Dr. King, looking for Martin, it behooves us to take history seriously, particularly those of us who call ourselves Americans. You know, I was telling a sister earlier, I, was, I had the honor of going to Japan in 2013 on behalf of the United States, the, the State Department. Why did I go to Japan in 2013? Because it was the 50th anniversary of the Dr. King speech, and they asked me to go over there and work with Japanese sisters and brothers around this message. And what blew my mind is that the Japanese sisters and brothers over there that I was working with were learning English by studying the civil rights movement, by studying this culture that I've been a part of for a long time called hip hop, and they knew more about American history and African American history than many of us in this country. What blew my mind? I'm in Wales a couple years ago. The centennial of the great Welsh writer Dylan Thomas, right? Dylan Thomas, who Bob Dylan took his name from because we know Bob Dylan was originally named Robert Zimmerman. In Wales, they knew more about American, black American history than a lot of us know. That blew my mind. Dr. King, as we should know, was born on January, 20, January 15th, pardon me, 1929, in Atlanta, Georgia. He was born into the upper class of Atlanta, Georgia. If you get a chance, if you've been to Atlanta, make, or if you have not been to Atlanta, if you go there, make it a point to go to the house where he was born. It's incredible, because you can see his family was doing well. Dr. King was born into a family of social justice workers. His father and grandfather were also both preachers. We know that Dr. King recognized injustice early on. In fact, he was on a trip once where he was with a chaperone and he didn't understand even as a child why do we have to move to the back of the bus right we know that dr king started college at age 15. morehouse college the historically black college for men in atlanta georgia we know that dr king graduated from college at age 19 he was already done and he was still a teenager he was a precocious child you know, we know that Dr. King spent some time in Philadelphia because he had finished his undergrad degree so early, he went and got another degree, Bachelor's of Divinity, because he, was re he realized at a certain point, I'm going to be not just a social justice activist, but I'm going to be a spiritual, faith-based leader, as they say today. We know that Dr. King spent four years, four years in this city y'all call Boston. Yeah, he did. He studied at Boston University, studied theology, and somewhere during this time between undergrad and grad school and coming to Boston to get his PhD, his doctorate, he discovered an Indian man from India named Gandhi. And we know that Dr. King was blown away by the fact that this Indian man was practicing something called nonviolence, and it brought the British Empire to its knees. Hey, British Empire, we as Indian people in the great country of India should have the right to govern ourselves. We don't want to be colonized or modern day slaves ever again. Dr. King was like, well, what if I took that principle of nonviolence and remixed it as a southern black preacher and brought it to the racism of this country? We know that it was in Boston that he also met his wife, Coretta Scott. What was Coretta Scott doing here? She was a great music artist. What do y'all call it, the New England Conservatory? Is that right? This was where she was studying. They got married in 1953. We know that there were some other things that were happening in America at that time that had a significant impact on Dr. King. One was the 1954 Supreme Court decision, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, which declared even though it was difficult to implement it, that legalized se separate but equal was not really separate but equal, it was actually unequal, and these schools need to change. What else happened during that time before the Montgomery bus boycott? A little black boy, what was his name? Emmett Till, from Chicago, went to visit relatives in Mississippi. He allegedly 
whistled at a white woman. This 14-year-old boy allegedly whistled at a white woman. Shortly thereafter, while Emmett Till is sleeping in the home of his relatives, there's a knock on the door. Grown white men came. You know? This is when we hear people talk about fragile white manhood. This ain't new. Grown white men came to take him out of the bed to teach him a lesson. 14 years old. Well, what did they do to Emmett Till? They beat him savagely. They gouged his eyes out. They tied a fan around his neck. And for good measure, they shot him in the head and then they threw him into the Tallahatchie River. So when you hear this story about Emmett Till, or Tamir Rice, or Sandra Bland, or Eric Garner saying, I can't breathe, or Michael Brown, or Trayvon Martin, are you ever going to again ask why they call it Black Lives Matter? His mother, Emmett, Mamie Till, brought Emmett's body back to Chicago and had an open casket because she said, I want the world and this country to see what they did to my child. That spark, and then a few months later, that was 1955, a few months later in the same year, a woman named Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a bus. By that point, Dr. King had his PhD, 26-year-old Dr. King. He settled with his own church in, in Montgomery, Alabama, called the Dexas, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. He, unbeknownst to him, folks called a meeting and said, we're going to have the meeting at Dr. King's church. He was, at first, reluctant, because he just wanted to have a simple life. I'm going to be a preacher, I have a church, I'm married. But, you know, so as we say in the black church tradition, sometimes you're called, some people are chosen. He was chosen. And that movement went on for a year. Black folks refused to get on those buses because of the racism. They carpool, people walk, people had their lives threatened. Dr. King had his home bombed. It's beginning him having his life threatened through the rest of his life, the next 13 years, over and over again. And when you think about it in retrospect, y'all, all they were fighting for. Can we sit anywhere we want on the bus? Can we come into this business, please? Can we sit at a lunch counter, please? Can I walk down the street without being knocked down? Just because of who I am. Can I vote? Can I vote? Can I vote? Can I vote? You're talking about really basic stuff here. They won. And we know out of that movement came Dr. King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 1957. We know that he became the face immediately of the Civil Rights Movement, what became known as the Civil Rights Movement. We know a year later, 1958, he was signing his, doing a book signing for his first book in New York City, in Harlem, New York. And while he was signing it, a woman came up to him who was mentally ill and stabbed Dr. King. And they said later, if he had sneezed, it was so close to his heart that he would have died. We know that in the late 1950s, there was also activity happening in places like Little Rock, Arkansas, the Little Rock Nine. We know by the early 1960s, there were young people, black and white young people, starting an organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We know there were sit-ins in places like Greensboro, North Carolina, Greensboro, North Carolina. We know there were black and white young people participating in something called the Freedom Rise. We know that Dr. King had great victories. We also know that he had great defeats in places like Albany, Georgia. Yeah. But the momentum of that movement exploded so much, so much, that by the time we got to 1963, there was a massive group of people who showed up in Washington, D.C., the March on Washington. I remember a couple years ago, I was standing right at the marker they have at the Lincoln Memorial where Dr. King gave the I Have a Dream speech. And I got on my cell phone and I caught my mother, who literally, as I may have said earlier, turned 20 years of age on August 28, 1963, the day of that march on Washington. And I said, Mom, because I'd never asked her the question. I said, where were you when this march happened? Well, you know where she was. She was in the backwoods of South Carolina in a tomb shack that was shared by her mother, her father, four girls, including my mother, and her brother. 
They were so poor that sometimes all they had to eat was some syrup that they pulled or poured around. Spilled, poured into a bowl and passed around, pardon me. They were so poor that the girls sometimes took turns going to school because there was one dress. There was no TV, there was no radio, there was no internet, there was no iPhones, Androids back in 1963. But what they had was the human internet, the human internet. And my mother said, we heard that there was these people going to Washington to fight for our rights. That blew my mind. You know, my mother didn't march. She didn't protest. She didn't sit in. She was not a part of any freedom rides. But the civil rights movement was so significant that when my mother had me a few years later, she understood some of the key things that I got to take from this is making sure that my son gets the education that I will never get. Are y'all with me out there? That he has the life that I couldn't have because I started picking cotton when I was eight years old. I was the help as a little girl in people's homes. Y'all know the March on Washington. People focus over and over again on the I Have a Dream speech, which is a powerful speech. It's only 17 minutes. It's a short speech. But we know that in that speech, Dr. King starts with a history lesson when he talks about Abraham Lincoln, and he's talking about the Emancipation Proclamation 100 years before, because that was 1863. And we know the March on Washington was 1963. And he says something very profound. In spite of all that's happened, the Negro is still not free. And then y'all know that famous quote where he says that we've been given a check that's been marked what, y'all? Insufficient funds. Democracy has been working for us. Then on top of that, if you read the I Have a Dream speech closely, if you listen to it closely, he actually uses the term police brutality twice in the speech. In spite of that, because of who he was as a human being, he says in the I Have a Dream speech, we can't drink from the cup of bitterness. No different than when Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high. Right? He says in that speech, all right, we here, but you got to go back to Alabama, back to Mississippi. We got work to do in our local communities. And then we fast forward a bit to that part of the speech where people like to say, well, Dr. King was colorblind. He didn't see color. Well, Dr. King actually saw color to the day he died. <laughs> because how could you not? That's like the nine part of who he was. Dr. King was a Southern black Baptist preacher, the way he spoke, the way he walked, the way he dressed. Little white boys and little white girls and little black boys and black girls. Judged by the color, not ju judged not by the color of the skin, but the content of the character. He's saying this was what I hope will happen. I would like that too. I would love for that to happen. Judge me as a black person by the content of my character. Judge me as a woman by the content of my character. Judge me as a queer person by the, as by the content of my character. Judge me as a disabled person by the content of my character. Judge me as a Jewish person or a Muslim person or a poor person or an immigrant person by the content of my character. Don't we all want that? Yes. He's saying we need to be equal, treated as equals. But he realizes that's not the case yet. And then you move over to Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will join hands and sing in the words of the Negro spiritual. What is Dr. King saying there? To me, he's saying we're all equals, Jews, Gentiles, Protestants, Catholics. If there's really one race, the human race, the human family, I believe that. I assume that y'all believe that because y'all are here. But we all have to bring what we have to the table equally. And when he says Negro spirituals, again, what is one of the greatest gifts that black folks have ever given America? The gift of music. So it's not this, I'm just going to integrate into your world. No, you learn me and I learn you. We share. Dr. King would never be that popular again for the rest of his life. One month later, two significant things happened. September 1963. Four little girls were praying in a church in Alabama. And they were the victims of domestic terrorism. Let's call it what it is. Just like there were nine black folks who welcomed a white brother named Dylan Roof into their church in South Carolina into their prayer circle, and then he proceeded to murder all nine of them. Are y'all with me out there? One was 1963, and one was in the 21st century. What is the difference? You know? 
What else happened in September 63? Bobby Kennedy, who I love, one of my heroes, and I'll explain why later, and he's the grandfather of Joe Kennedy III, who just gave that response to the president the other day. Bobby Kennedy was the attorney general under his brother, President John Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy was the one who first authorized the FBI to wiretap Dr. King, to monitor him. What are we monitoring here? This man's talking about nonviolence and peace and love. What's so dangerous about those things? What's so dangerous about bringing different types of people together? Why is that a threat? Well, we know in 64, a year later, we finally got a civil rights bill. We know in 64, Dr. King at the time was 35 years of age and became the youngest person to win the Nobel Peace Prize. This is important to say, when you hear leaders talk about I, 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 me, 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 when I see these churches all around the country, and I know y'all don't have this in Boston or the state of Massachusetts, but these mega churches, y'all know what I'm talking about, you know, where these preachers got private planes and private helicopters and VIP sections and multiple ATMs in their churches. Dr. King may have had three or four or five suits his whole life, right? When he won the Nobel Peace Prize, that means that he got a monetary prize. By that point in 1964, when he got that prize, he was a father, a husband, four children, but because he never wanted to appear to be pimping, manipulating the movement, he gave every dime from that prize back to the movement. Who does that? Except someone who's practicing what Dr. King called a dangerous kind of selflessness. A dangerous kind of selflessness. And Dr. King, let's be clear about it, he was a very human human being. He had issues around his skin color, why wouldn't he in a world of white supremacy where you're told lighter is better and darker is ugly? And we know that everyone in this room is beautiful and handsome no matter what you look like, no matter what your hair texture is. But he grew up in a world where he was told that's not attractive, right? He was a short man. He had issues around his height. We know that Dr. King was a chain smoker. He smoked cigarettes. In fact, there's a story that when he was assassinated, that one of the local preachers, who was one of his closest friends, actually removed a cigarette from Dr. King's hand because Dr. King never wanted young people to know that he was smoking cigarettes. You never, I've seen one photo of Dr. King with a cigarette. And we know that Dr. King cheated on his wife many times. Many times. He was a very human, human being. That's not to denigrate him. It's to say that we've got to stop people putting people on pedestals as if they're some sort of superhumans. I believe the reason why, for some of y'all who just came in, I said earlier, I've noticed when I first started doing Dr. King programs 20 years ago, it was just around his birthday. Now it literally stretches two months. We're so desperate for a superhuman, a superwoman, a wonder woman, a wonder man, a wonder person. We don't understand that the leadership that you're looking for is right in the mirror. So we put Dr. King up on a pedestal. We make it seem like he did everything by himself when there was a lot of anonymous sheroes and heroes. In fact, if we really are truthful about it, and we should be, hashtag me too, a lot of the early boycotts in the South were organized mostly by women. If we're honest about it, hashtag me too, as much as I praise I have a dream speech as one of the great speeches ever, look at the image of Dr. King, it's all men surrounding him. They did not want any women to be around that podium. Look at the photo. Where are the women at? Where are they? As much as we talk about Dr. King, you can't ignore Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer, two incredible women, and many, many others. 64, Civil Rights Bill, 64, Nobel Peace Prize, 65. What was going on after that? Selma, y'all saw the movie, Ava DuVernay's movie, Selma, Bloody Sunday, the march across the, the, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know? Selma to Montgomery. Black folks and white folks together getting beat up, right? Vote for basic voting rights. But they got a voting rights bill, but shortly after the voting rights bill came out in 65, a white police officer in a place called Watts, Los Angeles, killed a black person and the city exploded in what they call a riot or a rebellion. And Dr. King went out to Los Angeles, and y'all can find this on YouTube. Dr. King is sitting there in this YouTube clip and there's angry young black folks saying, get out of here, Dr. King. We don't want to hear that nonviolent stuff. And to his credit, unlike a lot of leaders, he sat there and he took it. He took the criticism. 
He, he listened to their anger, and one of his most famous quotes came out of that period when he said, a riot is the language of the unheard. But he also understood something in that moment. What does it matter that you can get on the bus if you ain't got no money to get on the bus? Sit anywhere on the bus, pardon me. What does it matter that you can go sit at that lunch counter if you got no money to buy a sandwich? And so he began to think about not just racism, but also class about economic justice. And a year later, in 1966, Dr. King and his wife moved to Chicago, to the west side of Chicago, to a rat and roach infested tenement building because he wanted to use his international platform. This is a best-selling author. This is a PhD. This is the quote unquote moral leader of the civil rights movement. This is a Nobel Peace Prize winner living in a roach and rat infested tenement. He said, if it's good enough for the people, it's good enough for me because he wanted to demonstrate how horrific poverty was, not overseas, but in America. A year later, Dr. King became one of the first national leaders to come out against the Vietnam War. He said in his speech, given on April 4th, 1967, one year to the day he was assassinated, we are sending poor blacks, poor black people and poor white people to go fight poor yellow people, Asian sisters and brothers, in a place called Vietnam. In that Vietnam War speech, which he did not read, he did not speak it the way he normally spoke it in the cadence of a black preacher, it was very monotone. He said in 67, 51 years ago, we, America, are the biggest purveyors of violence on the planet. Wow. He said in that speech, April 67, we were moving from being a people-oriented society to a thing-oriented society. In other words, this people have been replaced by these things. In that Vietnam War speech, 1967, he actually uses the term computer. Don't take my word for it, read the speech and listen to the speech. Because Dr. King was evolving constantly, constantly. And y'all know what happened. He gives that speech. He's called unpatriotic, just like the football players. He's called unloyal, just like the football players. He's called ungrateful, just like the football players. How dare he talk bad about our country? He needs to stick to local issues, stick to civil rights. But Dr. King said that silence is consent. How am I going to talk about nonviolence in America and then ignore all the violence that's happening globally? This is the Dr. King they don't want you to know about. This is Dr. King that we never learned. This is the Dr. King that I discovered when I really started reading things like Testament of Hope, Testament of Hope an important book edited by James Washington in 1986, which is the collective speeches and sermons of Dr. King, you see his evolution. This is what I learned when I watched the documentary film called Citizen King, Citizen King, Citizen King. This is what I learned when I watched a documentary series, 14 parts called Eyes on the Prize, Eyes on the Prize, which came out of folks here in Boston. It's free, y'all, on YouTube, Eyes on the Prize, right now. All 14 parts. we would do ourselves a disservice, anyone sitting in this room, because everyone in this room benefited from the Civil Rights Movement, so I think we have a responsibility to actually know what the Civil Rights Movement was. Like, how did we get here? We know that out of that Vietnam War speech, Dr. King began to craft something called a poor people's campaign, a poor people's campaign. He didn't say poor blacks, he didn't say poor whites, he didn't say poor brown people, poor yellow people, poor red people, he said poor people's campaign, because now Dr. King was fully shifting towards there needs to be equal opportunity for all people. There needs to be economic justice. Why should 1% of the country or the world have all the wealth while the rest of us are struggling? How many of y'all, even if you're middle class and college educated like me, have struggled seriously financially? That's most of the room. Go to college, buy a home, and you're still struggling. Where's the logic in that? This is what he's talking about. 
And so he started organizing a Poor People's Campaign in 1967, 1968. But what else was happening in 67, 68? Our great writer, Langston Hughes, whose birthday's today that we talked about earlier, who talked about dreaming long before Dr. King did, actually died in 1967. Langston's work was always based in working class people, poor people, the people from the community. What else was going on in 1967? Someone came from the West Indies, from the island of Jamaica, the great island of Jamaica, named Clive Campbell, AKA Cool Herc, who's one of the founding fathers, one of the pioneers of what we call hip hop. He was a DJ. Well, who created hip hop? What was Dr. King organizing at the end of his life? A poor people's campaign. Poor people, the same poor people Dr. King told us not to abandon, created this culture called hip hop. It started in the late 1960s. It overlaps with the civil rights movement. Poor people will make something out of nothing. What do we make something out of nothing? Microphone, turntables, vinyl records, magic markers, spray paint, cardboard to dance on. And that culture has now been around for 50 years, and it's all over the world. The same poor people that he said don't abandon. Dr. King was in Jamaica on vacation trying to get some rest. If you look at pictures of Dr. King in 1955, he's young and baby-faced. By the time you get to the mountaintop speech, he's still only 39 years old, which is young. But you can see the wear and tear of his life. You can see the death threats over and over again. You can see the harassment by the FBI. You can see all of it. You can see that he never really slept well, if at all. He's in Memphis, Tennessee, because he was asked to come there to support these black men who were wearing signs that said, I am a man, you know? And he did it because he understood, if I'm going to organize a poor people's campaign, well, these garbage men, these sanitation workers are the very people that I want to see get empowered. And he gets to this speech on April 3rd, 1968, one day to the day he's killed, the uh, mountaintop speech. I'm going to tell y'all, when I was a child growing up, that speech scared me. I don't know why it scared me, but it felt like death. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized, wait a minute, Kevin Powell, the mountaintop speech is Dr. King giving his own eulogy. I've been to the promised land. I've seen the mountaintop. I may not get there with you. But I'm here to tell you that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. Wow. And then you look at where we are right now, and you wonder why, or maybe we shouldn't wonder why, so many people are looking for Martin and are having so many Dr. King programs around the country. Because this man gave his life, literally, literally. Two months later, one of my other heroes, Bobby Kennedy, who, when he authorized the wiretap of Dr. King in 1963, Bobby was a very different person. He was about power, but not power for all people. But in 63, November, his brother, John, gets assassinated on national TV. It was as shocking then as 9-11 was for us in this generation, this era. Bobby Kennedy goes into mourning. Bobby Kennedy, who had been slow to support the civil rights movement in different ways. When he comes back to speak at the Democratic National Convention in 1964 in Atlanta City, Atlantic City in Jersey, where I'm from, the same Democratic National Convention where Fannie Lou Hamer, with her person hand, challenged the racism of the Democratic Party. Not the Republicans, the Democratic Party. Bobby Kennedy was a different person. Because out of that tragedy of his brother, the President of the United States, getting murdered on national TV, Bobby developed something that all of us need to have. Compassion, empathy, kindness for other people. When Dr. King was killed on April 4th, 1968, it was Bobby Kennedy in Indianapolis, Indiana, this white brother from privilege, and there's nothing wrong with privilege if you use it to help other people. This white brother from privilege got up and announced to a majority black crowd in Indianapolis 
that Dr. King had been killed. And Indianapolis was one of the few cities that did not explode in riot or rebellion that night. And y'all know the other city that didn't explode, it was Boston because James Brown was here. <laughs> Bobby Kennedy and James Brown, how you like that? <laughs> that's deep, ain't it? Yeah, that's pretty deep. One was a great speaker and one was a great artist and they both touched people, right? So Dr. King, and I'm gonna conclude here, asked the question, his last book, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? I submit uh, that if we're serious about moving ourselves, our communities, this country, this world forward, we got to hashtag, read, study, travel for the rest of our lives. It's not acceptable to just make up stuff if you don't really study history. How many of y'all saw the movie Lady Bird? Wasn't that a great film? The thing that stuck out to me other than, and I love Lady Bird's character, I love the, the director and writer, Greta Gerwig, but the fact that one of the characters was walking around with a book called A People's History of the United States, Howard Zinn. Well, who was Howard Zinn? Howard Zinn was a white brother, Jewish brother, who as a younger person participated in the civil rights movement. As he was organizing and working with black folks, he realized, man, I don't know anything about these black folks, which means I also don't know anything about American history. I might not even know my own history as a Jewish person in this country. And so he decided to create a book, a history book, that was from the perspective of all people as opposed to one narrow perspective. Are y'all with me out there? So we got to read, we got to study, we got to travel. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with being ignorant. There's something wrong with being what we call enthusiastically ignorant. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like when Hillary Clinton and Trump, Donald Trump were running for president in 2016, a week before I was in the great state of Washington, and I had a white brother who was an Uber driver, and I didn't, he didn't know who I was, and I just said, I said, well, how do you feel about this? I didn't even say Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative. I just said, how do you feel about this? You know what his response was? He said, well, Hillary Clinton is a communist Muslim who's gonna turn the country into a communist Muslim state. This is what he said. <laughs> and he believed it. And I said, wow. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> She's a communist Muslim. <laughs> Last time I checked, communist meant you didn't believe in God. Muslims believe in God, they say Allah, but he put it together. <laughs> now, we're, we're laughing about this, but there's someone like that who's now the President of the United States. There are people like that who are elected officials around the country. There are people like that who are teaching in classrooms around the country. You know? Who will think it's no big deal to leave women out of history, or queer people out of history, or black folks, or Latino folks, or any other group that's been marginalized or othered out of the education. Y'all with me? And so part of the work that we got to do is that we got to, we need a massive re-education in this country. People can say whatever they want about Dr. King, but you can't deny the fact that the man studied. We need to study. How are you going to call yourself an American you don't know anything about American history? Many of us don't even know who we are. The challenge for us in this room is like what bloodlines even go through you? Who are you? How did your people get here? And I want to say this as an African-American, and yes, I got European blood in me. I got Native American blood in me. I found just a couple years ago, my father's side, my father's father was not even black. He was half white, half Native American. A white man raped a Native American woman. That's how my father's side came about. You know what I mean? But the point I'm getting at is that we got a responsibility to know who we are. And as an African-American, stop saying this is a nation built by immigrants. That's disrespectful to Native Americans and it's disrespectful to African Americans who did not come here voluntarily. We were brought here as slaves. And for nearly 300 years, we built the economic infrastructure of this country, free labor. I was in one state where they call black folks who were slaves in the textbooks workers. <laughs> this is a nation that was founded, not founded at all. Native Americans were here, they had a different relationship to land. It belongs to all of us. It belongs to all of us. You know? Acknowledge my ancestors. Acknowledge all the people who have contributed equally. You know? And so I say to y'all, what are we gonna do? You know, I say to white sisters and brothers all the time, and I love all people, I love all people. You know, it can't be the work of people of color to challenge racism over and over again. You know what I mean? Many of my white friends who are progressives and liberals in New York City Several of them have said someone in their family voted for Donald Trump. 
Several of them have said to me, my family members are racist, they're anti-women's rights, they're anti-gay marriage, they're anti-everything. I'm like, well, the question becomes, well, what are you doing to challenge that stuff? What are you doing, right? Are you challenging the racism? For us as men, as I said earlier, you know, what are we doing to challenge the sexism? Even if you're not the kind of man who would ever call a woman a B-I-T-C-H or a H-O or a thought, God bless you. Even if you're not the kind of man who would ever put your hands on a woman, commit incest, molest, rape, murder, but you have men around you in the barbershop, in the synagogue, in the church, in the masjid, at work, while y'all watching the Super Bowl this weekend as sex trafficking is happening, and you say nothing about it, men, we become willing participants in sexism. Right? And so the question becomes, what are we willing to do? You know, I'm a heterosexual man, but Mayor Rasparaka, who's the mayor of Newark, New Jersey, about 14 years ago, his sister and her girlfriend, her partner, were murdered, shot down by the husband of their oldest sister, simply because they were lesbians. It was the saddest funeral that I'd ever been to in my life. And one of the things I said to myself, I said, for the rest of my life, I'm not going to turn my eyes away from anybody who's suffering or who's been marginalized or other anyway. We have to be allies for each other, y'all. We've got to be allies for each other. What we need in this country is a progressive, multicultural, multi-generational movement. But that's not going to happen if we're competing in what we call the oppression Olympics. And it's not going to happen if we don't learn about ourselves as Jews and Gentiles and Protestants and Catholics singing together in the words of the Negro spiritual. What are we bringing to the table, but also having the courage to learn about people who are different than us? Are y'all with me out there? And sometimes that work will be around Twitter and Facebook. Just post something. Sometimes it'll be at work. Sometimes it'll be door to door. Sometimes it will be marching and rallying and things like that. But it needs to happen. It needs to happen. Because we got to ask the question, in the spirit of Dr. King, do we want love or do we want hate? Do we want peace or do we want violence? Do we want compassion or do we want fear? It's really basic to me. That's where we are. And we got to get involved. We got to get involved. We got to get involved in your communities. You've got to do something. And if you don't know what to do, just ask. The shame is not knowing. There's no shame in not knowing. The shame is not knowing and never asking, well, what can I do? How can I do this? And the last thing, when I was younger, uh, not age-wise, intellectually, I asked myself a simple question over and over again. Why is this Dr. King dude talking about love so much? Well, shoot, you know? Last time I checked, hate is winning, y'all. Hate is winning all over the place. And so I think that we have a responsibility for historical reasons, for spiritual reasons, which is totally different than religion, organized religion, for spiritual reasons, our souls, for moral reasons, to choose love. To choose love, to choose love, you know? And when we don't do anything in these times, 100 years from now, People will look back on us and say, what were those people doing when all this was happening? You know? When I look at my sisters, Brenda, a black woman, and Laura Lee, a white sister, who worked together out of the great state of New Hampshire, across cultural lines, across racial lines, different backgrounds. I'm like, if they could do that, if they could do that, you know what I'm saying? What's wrong with the rest of us, right? So love, can we say love? love. Can we say love? love? Love, 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 love. That's what we need. Thank y'all so much. Can I, can I make a confession since WGBH is here? I'm, those letters excite me because as a kid, I watched Zoom on WGBH. <laughs> I used to love Zoom. And he used to always say, what was it, 02134? You remember the zip code? Was that the zip code, Ann? That's crazy, I remember that. Yes, ma'am. Anyone? Questions, thoughts? Yes, sir.
What's that? <laughs> How far you guys come from? You know, when I was a kid, seeing you guys on TV. I was a kid. Right. You're older than I am. No. Nah. No? Nah? I'm just messing with you. Uh, What's your name, sir? Uh, Marcus. Nice to meet you. I appreciate you coming here. Thank you. And speaking to the crowd. Um, and so, you know, there's been this thing probably for the past couple of years, uh, people in my community here in Boston that I've been talking to about like the term black, the term white, and like the divisiveness yeah. that comes with those terms yeah. and how we should set those terms aside and actually turn to other elements, other ways of identifying those. If you identify yourself as like hip hop culture. Um, and so yogi and vegan and skateboarder. Right, right, right. I have a few identities. And so I was just kind of hoping you would speak to that a little bit, give your perspective on you know the, the power of those words and possibly like dismantling yeah. that. That's, that yes, sir. That's a great question. Um, and thank you, Mr. Marcus, Brother Marcus. Um, um, well, I didn't create this social contract called race. Right. It was given to me. You know, what did Tupac Shakur say? I was, I was given this world. I didn't make it. And so, you know, um, we got Tupac fans out there. That's what's up, y'all. My, my Tupac book is actually coming out in 2019 or 2020. But, um, um, and I'm going to ask y'all again, can y'all not videotape it? Just trust WGBH will have it for y'all. They got it. Um, I would love to live in a world where there's no black, white, anything, you know, but that doesn't exist. That's the world I'd like to get to. That's the world that I hope to make. But at the same time, it's not an either or for me. I always want to push back on that because, like, I'm very proud to be an African person, an African person, a black person, you know, and I'm also very proud to be a member of the human family. So I embrace both. And there's certain things that I love. Like, I love the fact that I love spirituals. I love hip hop. I love, you know, Soul food, even though I'm a vegan now, I hunt out vegan soul foods around the country because I grew up with, I mean, I cannot not have sweet potatoes. I love watermelon, you know what I'm saying? I love the way I speak. I love the way my mama speaks, who's a Geechee from South Carolina. I love Jamaican patois. I love, you know, Haitian Creole. Y'all feel me? Safase, right? You know what I mean? And so I think, and it's the same thing like my friends who are Jewish in New York City or my friends who are Italian American. I don't think we should ever uh, uh, run away from who we are. We can be both. You can be a part of the human family, but you should also hold on to your identities. I think it's important. Um, and there's something beautiful. What, uh, Audre Lorde, the great Audre Lorde, the late great Audre Lorde, um, talked about, you know, finding, you know, unity in our differences, you know, finding commonality in our differences, you know, and I think there's something powerful about that. And so I don't want to, um, I don't want to erase myself, you know, um, but I feel like if we're politically mature and emotionally mature, like, like Sister Laura Lee and Sister Brenda, they embrace who they are, their individual identities, but they also know how to come together, am I right? You know, you do both, you do both. It's not an either or, you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, to me, that's more powerful than just like, let's just get rid of white and black because I almost feel like that's erasing people. You know what I'm saying? And I think part of the problem with America is that we've been trying to get people to erase their identities forever. It's like, you know, I'll meet folks who said, you know, who are Italian American, for example, who within the first generation, they no longer spoke Italian. It was gone. You know, I'm, I know people who are Puerto Ricans who don't speak, Port speak Spanish at all. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, there's something wrong with that. You know what I mean? Folks who are Filipino, who are Chinese, who are like, they're, they're, they've been told you got to get rid of your, no, we should be proud of our culture. Or whatever our heritages are, we should be proud of it, you know? And so I think, to me, that's my response. Human race, but also hold on to your identity or multiple identities. You know, I think that's more powerful than just okay, no more white, no more black, you know? I think that, you know, you can still love people while you love yourself. And how are you gonna love anyone else if you actually don't love yourself? Do you know what I'm saying? That's what I feel. I It'll come I to you, Ms. Brent. No, the mic is coming. <laughs> hey, no matter. Great Hi. DJ in Boston. <laughs> Welcome back to Boston. Thank you. Um, Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Um, well, I just wanted to speak a little bit about my feelings on Colin Kaepernick. Okay. Pronounce his name properly. You did. Um, okay. Um, the movement he started by kneeling during the national anthem. Um, I feel personally that he could be one of the great leaders to look out for in the movement. Um, recently, he just wasn't advertised um, mass on a mass level. But recently, he just completed his goal of the million dollar pledge where he was at asking his friends and colleagues to donate, uh, um, match his donation of $10,000 to various charities. So yeah. I follow him on Instagram and I reposted one of his posts. And I just, that kind of follow along, follows along my feelings of, 
what happened with him in football. Yeah. Just it. I mean, he took it upon himself to kneel to make. He's like, I don't believe in what's going on right now. What can I do? He used his platform, and I just think that he's definitely someone to look out for because for him to do that and then still make the move he just did and continue to do so. It's j I just feel like you know that was just a stepping stone for greater things. So yeah. I just want to know your opinion on him and what he did. I love Colin Kaepernick. Let me say that first of all, because I think it takes um, <laughs> tremendous courage to do what he did. And you know, there's a lot of thoughts come to my mind whenever I think of Colin Kaepernick. You know, here's a brother who is half white, half black, um, and you know, I saw people saying stuff like, go back to Africa. I'm like, well, he probably would have to go back to Wisconsin, actually. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the ignorance, the enthusiastic ignorance again. Um, but because he identifies as a black man, because he understands when you uh, live in this society, you know, going back 100, 200 years, one drop of blood, people say, oh, you're, you're, you know what I'm talking about, as a multicultural woman. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, uh, even like, when I remember I mentioned that my, my father's father was not even black. Uh, he was half white, half Native American. Well, guess where he had to live? In the black community because no one else would take him. You know what I'm saying? So I support Colin Kaepernick. He's in the spirit of Paul Robeson, great athlete and, and, and activist. He's in the spirit of Muhammad Ali. He's in the spirit of Arthur Ashe. He's in the spirit of a lot of Billie Jean King, you know, because we can't just let, let this be, be about, about, about men. Martina Navratilova, folks who stood up for other issues and they understood they had the sports platform. Let me say this as well. I saw some folks from uh, my family's home state of South Carolina saying, you know, people need to stand up at the Super Bowl. They need to stand up at the Super Bowl because they're terrified that folks are going to take a knee at the Super Bowl. People are more concerned about people taking a knee than all the black folks that have been killed over the last several years, you know, because of vicious, racist, domestic terrorism in this country. You know what I mean? And then they're talking about the flag. They tr conveniently turn into this conversation about the flag. You know, this is not about, and veterans, you know what I'm saying? Well, if you really know anything about history, black folks have actually fought in every single war in American history. In fact, the only black person I probably got when I was growing up was Crispus Attucks, you know what I'm saying? Who died at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. And so they conveniently twist things around and make it seem like black folks are not just patriotic. Guess what? When black folks win medals at the Olympics on behalf of the United States, who wraps themselves with flags first? The black sprinters, the black runners, you know what I'm saying? And so they make up stuff. And then they conveniently, because they don't know history, Francis Scott Key actually supported slavery, the man who wrote the Star Spangled Banner. There's a paragraph that was removed from the Star Spangled Banner that was about black folks needing to be shipped somewhere. But guess where they were shipped? They were tripped, shipped to Trinidad and Tobago in the West Indies. They were called Americans, and to this day, they're still descendants of those folks that Francis Scott Key wanted out of the country. We need to know history, y'all. Basic history. How are you going to talk about a flag or an anthem? You don't even know where these things came from. Do you know what I'm saying? And so Colin Kaepernick was responding as any person of color would respond. I'm seeing viral videos of things like Eric Gardner, you know, who was simply selling some loose cigarettes and some CDs on the street so he could feed his family. He's being chokehold to death, and he's saying not once, not twice, 11 times, I can't breathe. You're going to tell me just because someone is a multimillionaire football player or basketball player, you can't have any feelings? That's not gonna affect you? You know what I mean? That's insane to me. You know, that's like saying to women, like when my wife does her show, She, which is about violence against women and girls, the women who sit there, even with all the music and humor in there, there's no way the women are gonna sit there and watch these performances and not feel, as a woman, what it's like to be violated. You feel what I'm saying? And so there are people out there who want us to deny our own humanity, you know what I mean? As black people, as people of color, as immigrants, as queer people, as women, as disabled people, as poor people, like, you know, just shut up. You know what I'm saying? I talked to some of my queer friends in other parts of the country, and I asked them, you know, how do you survive here? They said, we just keep to ourselves because they're scared of being murdered because of who they love. You feel what I'm saying? And so I, I don't mean to get real super passionate about this, but like, you know, Colin is right. And these football players are right. And what they're doing now is classic divide and conquer because they're pitting the football players against each other, you know, and making it seem like he's the problem, you know, or the ones who protest are the problem. 
And the real issue is, you know, most of these owners of these football teams, like the league is 70% black males, the NBA is 80% black males. Why is Michael Jordan the only majority black owner in the NBA, and where are the black owners of the NFL? If you believe in democracy and opportunity, you feel me? Just like it's ridiculous that when Michelle Williams and Mark Wahlberg, your homeboy from here, you know, went to reshoot a film and he got a million dollars and she got like, what, a thousand dollars? If that, you don't hear any outrage about that. You know what I'm saying? And so these discrepancies, and so what I'm saying to y'all too out there, as sisters and brothers, everyone out there as human beings, people want y'all to fight each other. You know, black folks versus white folks, straight folks versus queer folks, you know what I mean? Rich folks versus poor folks. As long as y'all are fighting each other, that one small percentage of folks who really are about power for themselves will keep their power. As long as we're fighting each other. Because that's what people want. You know, which is why I did not talk about my New York Yankees today. Go Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> because y'all who know me know I'm a diehard New York fan, sports fan. But I said, let me not come in here. Let me bring unity here today. <laughs> Even though I'm jealous. But this is, you know, Miss Brenda, I'm sorry. So let me first give an honor to God. Yes, ma'am. And secondly, thank you so much for that trip down history. Wow. And knowing Martin a little bit better. Uh, so I, I give you thanks and praise for that. Thank you. But finally, I do agree with Brother Marcus mm. about this black and white situation. You want to get rid of it too? As you know. You said uh, this before, that's right. Yes, of course. Yes. I wrote about it. Can before. you tell people what, it, what your vision is? Well, my vision is that people of African descent uh, back in uh, my grandmother's day, we were considered color. Yes, ma'am. And she referred to herself as that until she died. Yes, ma'am. Then later on, we were Negroes. We were Malawian. Mm. We were Afro-Americans. And now we are considered African-Americans. I personally call myself a person of African descent. Mm. But I believe that the black and the white divide us. Okay. I don't think changing from, for me, African descendant or European descendant, Caucasian, what have you. But the white, when we say white, we have an image that comes to mind. Mm. When we say black, we have an image that comes to mind. And sometimes that image is negative. And so I think it is associated with those colors. Mm. So I think that language also serves to divide us. But okay. I really enjoyed you, and thank you. No, this is important food for thought, thank you. And so you're saying, which I agree with, if we're really leaders, we need to create a new vocabulary, which is what leaders do, create a new vocabulary. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Um, I just walked in. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. So hey. I missed you speaking so far, but I did hear you. And I wanted to emphasize that the identification with blackness has nothing to do with race and division. We, as human beings, need to be, re be educated to appreciate the substance of blackness. It's the substance of all good things. Um, physics, in physics we know that um, blackness is the substance of the entire universe. Sometimes they use derogatory terms to describe it, such as an abyss, as a whole. Really, when we say whole for blackness, we should be spelling it W-H-O-L-E. Um, blackness is a reference culturally, not altogether to skin color when the individual uses that term to describe themselves. In other words, I may say I am black even though my skin color is not literally black. The reference to black as, as self-identity is available to any human being if all of us come from the Nubian beginning of humanity. Um, the reference to the color black, in my appreciation, is a reference for my human source. The source of my mortal beginnings is in blackness. My forefathers are black, literally black skinned. And I, it's very painful when I hear people of color in particular running around saying, there's no such thing as a black person. I'm brown skinned. When in fact, even today we have people from Sudan 
which is where even the Israelites come from, Sudan, or Southern Sudan. In other words, the Niger Congo. We all come from the Niger Congo and migrate from there, not from the Horn of Africa, not from, from uh, Israel, okay? So my point is that my forefathers are black-skinned, as are the Sudanese people of today, most of them, or if, if I may just say some of them. Black skin, their black is coal. And that's my, those are our origins. And the scientists still can't figure it out. We're too busy trying to pretend that we're all alike. Can I, you, can't, you can't appreciate differences so, when you're trying to pretend we're all alike. Even our blood is not alike. Can we, okay? can we, thank you, thank you. No, sir, right. thank you. Anyone else? You all all right out there? WGBH? I want a job. Is Zoom still, is there still a version of Zoom? That show is dope. I love it. Yes, sir. Peace. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask, how do you actually start? Because, you know, when we talk about this problem we have, but how can we actually start to resolve? How, how do we start? Engaging in your community? Yeah, but how? I'm saying, are you asking to engage in your community? Are you in a member of an organization right now? Of any kind? No. I would start there, because I think a lot of times what I run into, folks want to start organizations, you know, uh, but don't actually know how organizations uh, operate. I think we got to study organizations and movements. Like, you know, this is where the reading, hashtag reading, study, traveling comes back to me. Like, you know, um, for me, it was in college, you know, we were told you can't just jump in this organization. You actually got to know how this operates, you know, and how to organize, how to be involved in that particular community. That community for us was a college campus. And I took those skill sets I learned in college into the community. Not everyone goes to college, you know, but wherever you are, you have a responsibility to study. And so if you want to get involved in the community, I would ask simple questions. Like even this, this area where we are, you know, two of the most famous leaders of the civil rights movement lived in Boston at, different, at certain points, Malcolm X and Dr. King. But what did, what did Dr. King do here? What did, what did he learn here? What did Malcolm learn here? You know, uh, something as simple as reading the Ma autobiography of Malcolm X to me will inspire action. That's something that I read cover to cover. And I was like, wow, if Malcolm could do this, you know, including spending seven years in jail in this part of the country. And while he was in jail, he's reading books in the, in a prison, in the prison, you know, and re-educating himself. And then he came out and he started organizing via a vehicle called the Nation of Islam. Then I can do something, you know what I mean? And so I think you got to study people who've come before you. An accountant or a writer, anything, right? If you didn't study who came before you, you feel what I'm saying? You know, y'all quarterback, uh, uh, Tom Brady, said who he studied as a child growing up was Joe Montana, who won four Super Bowls. Well, Brady won, has won five, about May won his sixth. He studied who came before him so he could be better than they were. And so the same thing applies to what we do in the community. Because I think the passion is there for a lot of people. And, and I'll tell you, in New York City, well, we've had big rallies and marches. Folks are out there yelling and screaming and everything like that. But when we call for meetings afterwards, maybe, 30, 40 people show up, and most of them are women, usually. The dudes disappear, you know what I'm saying? You know, this is not a game. Like, you know, we have to actually know how to organize. Can you, can you speak? Can you do budgets? Can you fundraise? Can you interact with people? Can you write a little bit? Do you have some sort of skill set that, that could be useful to the community? Music, like DJ Nomadic, you know, that everyone loves music, right? That's a tool to get people into the, to the room. And so I think that, you know, study movement, study the anti-apartheid movement, study the civil rights movement, you know, there's so many different movements to say what was going on in, in Ireland, what was going on in Northern Ireland, since we're in an area where there was a lot of Irish sisters and brothers here in this country. You know, study the feminist movement. What is the hashtag Me Too movement? Why did it morph into time, hashtag Time's Up? What's that about, you know? And so the, I'm throwing out a lot of stuff there. I would say read Malcolm X's autobiography cover to cover, read Howard Zinn's book of People's History of the United States cover to cover. If we can't come out of those two books with some ideas, concrete ideas on what to do, then that's on us. But there's plenty of stuff in there, you know? Um, and you gotta be engaged in your local community. People need to see you. People need to see you, you know what I mean? Like in Brooklyn where I live, and I love Brooklyn, people know Kevin Powell is in that community. He's accessible and available. What do we gotta do today, you know what I'm saying? And so you gotta be a vibrant part of the community that you live in. That's very, very important, you know? Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, my name is Roots Pierre. I just want to say again, thank you for thank being you. here and doing this. 
Mr. Pierre. Yeah, uh, but I wanted to actually um, talk to you in regards to okay, the history and the fact that Christopher Columbus discovered, quote unquote, America in 1492, but this country didn't become formed until 1776. And so that whole classism thing that you're addressing about the whole indentured servant, and that's again, they were able to have the kids seven years and they got their freedom, and then 15, what, what did they do with their first, Jamestown they imported the first Africans, and that's when they're like, oh, they have to switch the economy from indentured servants to yep. slavery. So classism doesn't exist, folks. Yeah. Just again, this country is a wonderful country, it's founded on ideology, it's a corporation, but the thing is, like, even like simple things like jury nullification. Mm. They don't educate people on that. And it's actually the U.S. Bar Association came together and made a self-formed union and said, don't tell the people they have the right to sit on a jury and say, nullify the law. And that's what they did in the Southern whites when they wanted to free them and say, hey, they did the lynching, but let them go. But we don't know that we have the right to be like, hey, I believe in marijuana. It's a plant. Don't destroy it. Okay? The government's fooling us to actually believe Mother Nature is our enemy. I'm like, how do you, like, if you're so powerful, get rid of tsunamis, get rid of earthquakes. I'm just saying, like, again, mm. it's like, it is it is a power struggle, and they do, the divide and conquer thing exists. It does exist. And it's like, you've got to have the mental fortitude to understand that it's we, the people, all right? Not aristocracy, not, again, they, it's been changed from gods to feudalism to now we have America. It's like they replaced the king and queen and put the president, and now the president's trying to act like a king. And like Trump, like he's really thinking like, no, I can get rid of the FBI. They no longer believe in the justice system. So I'm just thinking like, thank you again for talking about this, but uh, we should always be talking also about our economic freedom in this country. Because it's like, we can make the revolution profitable, then we can actually take over, I think. Mm. What do you think? I think that no, thank you. Um, I just want, it's, I'm just a simple dude. I just want everyone to have an opportunity. And to this gentleman's question, because as you were speaking, you actually triggered some thoughts for me. Um, you know, if you are a citizen of this country, vote on a consistent basis. You know what I mean? Um, and not just in the presidential elections, the local elections are actually much more critical. Uh, where I live in Brooklyn, you know, if you go to downtown Brooklyn, the court district, any day of the week, Monday through Friday, is nothing but black and Latino folks being sent upstate to jail. You know what I mean? Very few of us even understand that we get to vote for judges and district attorneys and, you know, if you don't participate in the jury system, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, what do I think? I just want everyone to have an opportunity. You know, the reason why I was able to go to college is because of something called the Educational Opportunity Fund, a program that was created in the same year Dr. King was killed, legislation so that so-called disadvantaged children, I'm sure there's some sort of similar program here in Massachusetts, were able to go to college, you know what I mean? And literally, you know, y'all talk about backlash now, there's a backlash, the Trump thing is a backlash to Barack Obama, well there was a backlash to the Civil Rights Movement. The moment that the Civil Rights Movement was over, there was a backlash, instantly. You know what I mean? And I'm going to say it again. What were they fighting for? Basic citizenship rights. Can we vote? Can we go move about freely without getting killed? And almost instantly, all of that was wiped out, which is why we're still having conversations about police brutality, racial profiling, all that kind of stuff. And so what I'm saying to you, sir, is that we have to find what we're passionate about. For me, when I was an 18-year-old, when I read Malcolm's autobiography, you know, race became the issue that I, had, I wanted to confront, I wanted to deal with. But you never stop growing, you never start evolving. So over time, I said, okay, I gotta deal with gender issues. I gotta deal with gender identity issues. I gotta deal with class issues, as the brother said. I gotta deal with all this stuff. I'm a vegan now, you feel what I'm saying? I think about environmental justice issues. You know, I think about food deserts. I work with people who are at work doing work in those spaces. I work in the arts, you know, Sister Ann out in the audience, Sister Nomadic out in the audience, people who have worked in the artistic community, because what better way to bring people together than the art and music, you know what I'm saying? Building communities, and so the thing for me is I always think about how many communities I can belong to. When Brother Marcus asked the question, he said something about me and hip hop, and I kind of jokingly said, I'm in multiple communities, I wasn't lying. I'm in the human race, I'm in the black community, the African community, because I do claim it like you do. I'm also in, in, in the yoga community, I'm in the meditation community. Just last night, I'm in a meditation circle in Brooklyn, because I'm like, I need therapy and counseling to deal with this kind of stuff in this world, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Seriously, you know what I mean? I'm a runner, I'm in that community of runners. I'm a skateboarder, I got four longboards, you feel what I'm saying? But every community that I'm in, I'm like, how do we move the needle? That should be the conversation, how do we move the needle? And do I, am I bringing something to the table to help move the needle, or do I need to deal with my own skill sets? You know, what do I need to improve in myself? You know what I mean? What do I need to do better? You know, 10 years ago, I was barely interested in social media, and I was not interested in blogging at all, because I'm just a little bit above before that, not above, before that, where we call blogs essays. And so I was like, how dare they call these things blogs? You know what I'm saying? 
And I realized, Kev, you gotta get with the times. You gotta evolve, man. You know what I mean? And guess what, Kev? You may have 13 books, but guess what? Most people think you only got two because for a long time you didn't mention anything on social media about any of the stuff you do. You know what I mean? You never know who that might be affecting in the communities that you can have be a part of online as well. But the thing that I, I stress, especially to, to anyone who says they want to serve, you got to pick up mad skill sets. You got to pick up skill sets because the most important thing you can do if you want to help your community is be prepared. You know what I mean? Sister who's sitting there right next to you, you know, she said she lived in Japan for years. So the first question I asked her, you speak Japanese fluently? She said, yup. I was like, how many of us in America can say we speak one, two, three, four languages? Yo hablo espanol, es muy importante, you know what I mean? But I grew up with Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and Jersey City and Mexicanos and Peruvians. And so I learned Spanish watching Zoom and Sesame Street and a lecture company <laughs> and my friends playing merengue and salsa next door, arroz con pollo. I would come over and eat some food with them. I was like, this language is important. You feel what I'm saying? Make sense? So what do we want to do? So we got to do a check in the mirror first. What skills do I have? as I'm looking for Martin, that I can make useful to the community. And this is not just young people, this goes for the elders as well. Anyone who's over 50, 60 out there, y'all are valuable. Y'all are valuable. We do ourselves a disservice as younger people when we don't sit with elders and ask questions. Tell me about your life, your experiences. How did you get through this stuff? You know what I mean? So I can pick some, I can take some things. I grew up without a father. I had no father figure. And so any chance I get to sit with an older man, I'm listening. Tell me how you did it. You know what I mean? My wife's uh, uh, uncle sitting out in the audience, her grandfather on her mother's side was married for 60 years. I asked him a simple question as a man who never saw a healthy relationship in my family. How'd you do it? He said two words, well three words, uh, four words, I made a commitment. I was like, wow, that's a skill set. Because a lot of folks can't commit to anything. <laughs> and especially in these times with our short attention spans because of these things. And so nothing's going to change either if we don't make a commitment. I started as an activist when I was 18 years old, a teenager. I am definitely not 18 years old anymore. You know what I'm saying? But at a certain point I realized, Kev, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. This is for the long haul. You know what I mean? So I've withstood, I've been, I've been out here, brother, when people used to disrespect the word activist. No matter knows what I'm talking about, folks know what I'm talking about. Are you still doing that stuff? You still doing that gender stuff, that feminist stuff, that black stuff, that justice stuff? You still talking about that stuff? Yup, I sure am. Until all of us are free, I definitely am. So that's what we gotta do. Yep. And I'm down to share my, my number, email with folks who wanna stay in touch, you know, because I also think that if you, put yourself out there, you should be accessible, you know what I'm saying? So, Kevin at KevinPowell.net, it's mad easy, Kevin at KevinPowell.net, you know what I'm saying? Hey, Laura Lee, what's up, sister? Thank you for being here. Thank you, I can't wait to get up to New Hampshire, let's do it. Okay. Yes, she's from, New Emily's from New Hampshire. Hey, Emily, we're gonna invite you, we're gonna have you address. Yeah. Um, I just love what you say about continually learning, listen to a young person, my mother is um, gonna be 91 years old, Wow, and, wow. Um, she was born and raised in South Boston, um, a Southie, an Irish. Um, I was going to say Irish. Poor, wow, yeah. But they're very proud. Yeah. They're, they're poor. And um, Southie later moving to Everett. My father is from Chelsea. Yeah. And um, my whole family is from Massachusetts. And my mother's 91 years old. And um, she was a big part of me writing this book and learning about racism and um, what racial, she grew up in this city, highly segregated city, yeah. um, a lot of racial tension in the city, even to the 70s, into the mm -hmm. busing for children to get to public school. She said, I don't. She said. <laughs> <laughs> we missed that, what happened? <laughs> what just happened? And uh, she's still learning. She's still growing. She's uh, learning okay. terms. Um, sometimes she messes up her terminology, but um, it's my daughter, and, and I love to see that huge age gap between. I was a late in life baby, so my, I'm still a little young, but my mother's old, and my daughter's 15, and they're sharing and continuously learning, and it's never too old. And um, even elders have something to offer to the community. I love her stories and. Um, I love it. As brutal as they are from this area, I love yeah. her stories. Let me ask, so what's your name? Your daughter? Alexandra. 
If I could go back in time, I wish that I could spend time with my grandmother, my mother, the only grandmother that I knew, and just sit there and absorb everything. And so please take advantage of that because that, there's stories there. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, Boston has this stigma, y'all know, you know. Um, and I, I used to be one of those folks like, yeah, Boston, Boston, Boston. But when I think back on it now, I realized what it was was just people being pitted against each other, you know what I mean? And people not knowing because of ignorance. And, you know, there's so many things that Irish folks history is very similar to black folks history. And when I went to Ireland a few years ago and, and I started hearing about history in a different kind of way from the people there and I said, this sounds like the migration inside of America with black folks, the internal immigration that we had, you know what I'm saying? But you know, this is when I said we got work to do. You know, we gotta get into these communities. There's gotta be a re-education. There's gotta be a re-education. You know, there's, there's no other way to say it. And the fact that she's 91 and open to changing for, for vocabulary, as we're talking about with Sister Brenda, you know, says a lot. My mama is definitely a black female Archie Bunker. I don't know how else to say it. She says whatever comes out of her mind, mouth, and she's raw and unfiltered. And if you think about Archie Bunker, for those who are too young, Archie Bunker was like Donald Trump, basically. Whatever he felt, he said. <laughs> Except that Archie Bunker didn't become president of the United States. Donald Trump did, which is crazy. Archie Bunker is in the White House. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I've had to challenge my mother, like, Ma, you can't say that about white folks. You can't say that about queer folks. You can't, you know, call people, you know, names, you, you know. I'm trying to be polite about it, but my mom's is off the chain. <laughs> Woo. You know, meanwhile, her son is not that way, but I also understand she, like your mother, comes from the old, what we call the old country, the old world. You know what I'm saying? And our responsibility is to take the good that we can get from them, challenge them, but also, you know, um, leave behind the stuff that just doesn't work. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe one or two. Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, What's your name? My name is Sade. Hey, Sade. Hi. How do you um, spell it? I spell it S H A R D A E. Wow. My mom got it from the from the singer though. But she put her spin on it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's how we do. <laughs> um, well, I want to say thank you for being here. Um, it was thank very you. stuff I didn't know about Dr. King and all the luminaries that you spoke of. Um, just so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, my question though is um, actually in regards to when you said how um, people studied those that came before them to be great. Um, I was just curious, who did you look up to or read um, as you started your journey in being a writer? Oh wow. <laughs> That's a great question, especially since we're in a library. And I got to tell you, there's a chapter in my, um, my book outside called The Library. This is how the library is so near and dear to my heart. Um, when I was um, eight years old, my mama uh, said, we're going to the library. And we're going to get library cards. And so we walked through the hood, you know, and um, she got a library card, I got a library card. And um, honestly, the first books I read were sports books. I'm a big sports fan. And so whenever I meet people who say they don't like to read, I always say you should read stuff that you're interested in. Even, you know, even comic books are important, you know. Whatever, something, you gotta read. We have to read. And I thank my mother for that because she really instilled in me a love of it. And I, I need to stress this. We had no books in the house. The Bible and the newspaper, that was it. There were no books, but that library card meant the world to me because it got me to expand my imagination. And so I went back and forth for about three years. And I was reading stuff, honestly, with sports and entertainment. Like I would read like the history of, of the Oscars. I like knew every Oscar winner from 1929 to whatever year I was a kid, which is crazy when you think about it. I was like 10 years old. Like, oh, Clark Gable and you know, Marlon and Dietrich and Greta Garbo, I was just reading stuff. Then when I was 11, I discovered a book called For Whom the Bell Tolls by Ernest Hemingway. You know what I mean? And I remember seeing the book, because by that time I was able to move over to the adult section. And I was like, yeah, you know, as a kid from the hood, if, who is the bell tolling for? Because they ain't tolling for me, you know what I'm saying? And I remember the book, the title, because there was a Gary Cooper movie Gary Cooper played the character in the movie version of it, and I just said, oh, they took the title from the movie, not realizing the book created, the, the movie came from the book. And I read as much of the book as I could understand. You know, I read the whole book, but I read, understood as much as I could. I was in love with the fact that it was a love story. I remember that, and it was set during the war, and then there was all the references to Spanish. And again, because I was growing up in a city that had a lot of Latino, Latinx folks, Latino, Latin, Latino sisters and brothers, I was intrigued. So I went back to the library, and I found this thing that y'all have never heard of because y'all are too young in this room called encyclopedias, right? <laughs> and uh, I looked up an encyclopedia who Hemingway was. And at the, I'm 11, so I don't understand that he committed suicide at the end of his life. That wasn't a part that I, I didn't even grasp that. I remember it's just, you know, house in Key West, you know, fish, Cuba, you know, running with the bulls. And I remember saying to myself, man, if this is what a writer does, then I want to be a writer, <laughs> right? 
but because of the wonderful integrated schools that I went through, went to K through 12, never got a single black ride. I didn't know who Langston Hughes was, so I got to college. You know, I didn't know about Maya Angelou, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Pablo Neruda, anyone. The only woman writer I got of any race was Emily Dickinson. That was it. You know what I mean? And so why do I say that? It's important no matter who you are to see yourself in your education, to see yourself in your education because you begin to think things are possible. And so even though I knew I wanted to be a writer, since I was a child, I kept it to myself and I went toward other stuff. My high school yearbook actually says accountant because I won the math award when I graduated from high school. I was really good at math. It wasn't until I got to college and I read Malcolm X's autobiography, it blew my mind. And I cried when I put the book down because I could not believe that one, someone like this existed and he was constantly evolving and then he was dead. I had no idea. And then that led me toward, I didn't know what the Harlem Renaissance was. You know, who was, who was Langston? Who was Zerino Hurston? Who were these people? I didn't know what the black arts movement was in the 60s. You know, I didn't know about the New York poetry movement of Latino writers in New York City. You know, I didn't know what a, a, a tanka or a haiku were from Japanese literature, from Japanese literature. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know any of this stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, I knew Shakespeare. I knew Keats. I knew Chaucer. I knew Voltaire. I knew Charles Dickens. I, you know, I loved their work, but it meant something different when I started to read books that came from my community. You know, just like, you know, we talk back to Irish American Irish. When I first read Frank McCourt's Angela's Ashes, the great book by the late great Irish American writer, I was like, wow, man. You know what I mean? This makes me understand the Irish experience in a very different way between here and Ireland. Do you know what I'm saying? And so it was in college, unfortunately, when I started, I digested uh, black books. I discovered the E-185 section of the library where all the black books are. I worked in the library for two years. They would always, Kevin Powell, where are you? I was like, in the, in the, in the section with the books. I, I realized that I had to get a whole new education, which included myself. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and it hasn't stopped since then. I mean, in my bag, back in my hotel, I'm rereading Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man for the first time in over 20 years because when you read certain books that have shaped your life, you should read them every 5, 10, 15, 20 years because you'll see things that you didn't see before. Later this year, I'm going to read some Steinbeck. I, I love Grapes of Wrath, you know what I mean? And, and, but I, it was important for me to be rooted in black history and black culture and black literature. Not, not, I love Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare, you know what I mean? When I've read Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it's just noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows. I was like, word, son, that's me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You feel what I'm saying? Shakespeare, Tupac, same thing. These questions. I mean, Shakespeare's full of violence and you know, all kinds of madness. Well, so is hip hop, you know what I'm saying? And so I look at literature as everything. I mean, Bob Dylan's literature to me, Joni Mitchell's literature to me, Paul McCartney and John Leonard's literature, Lauren Hill's literature. This is the 20th anniversary of the miseducation of Lauren Hill. Um, you know, um, anything that moves my spirit, does that make sense? Yeah. Related to a lot of what you said. My mother took me to the library when I was little. Actually, she's from, she's from Costa Rica. That's my brother and sister. Say bless me, all. Very little. You're going to work on that. I, I understand it better than I can speak it. I've had people literally come up to me and speak Spanish, and I'm like, oh, I, my, I'll like write down an answer because I'm like, I understand what they said, but I can't say it back. <laughs> but you will work on that. I know. Yeah. I do. I, I want to. I need mean, to. Um, be more committed to that. I know you spoke on that earlier. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But um, yeah, my mother took me to the library when I was little, and that definitely instilled a love of books and reading for me. And it was actually my third grade teacher that told me that um, like I have a, a skill for writing, and it's stuck with me since third grade. But um, you should write. Do you write? I do. Um, I have more of a creative fiction, um, a creative writing background. I graduated from UMass Boston. Oh, cool. Um, I have a BA in English. So you're a writer? Yeah. Are you a writer? I am. Of, um, you're a what? I, I do. You're a what? <laughs> well, I'm working more now. You are a what? Writer. Okay. Writer. Writer. <laughs> <laughs> we have to claim it. Yeah. That's all right. I put a lot of pressure on myself to, to be a great writer. So I wanted to ask you that question, like, what can I read to? Read the, great, read the great writers that came before you. You know, read the Maya Angelou's, read the Nikki Giovanni's, read the Shakespeare's. You got to read everything you can get your hands on. You know, I think that, that's critical. Uh, we have to be students, I believe. Um, I don't know if the brother's here. I, he hit me on Facebook. Uh, I think his last name was D Dwyer. Um, 
someone hit me on Facebook earlier and it said that he was a teacher and he was a student. And that stuck with me because we have to be students for the rest of our lives. You know, and I think, you know, if you're a writer, then you have to just start writing. You know, Boston has a rich, I mean, this is Boston. Y'all got a lot of great artists that have come through here. A lot of great writers have come through here. This is a rich, I mean, this library is the bomb. I love this library, you know, and I just think you got to put yourself in spaces of creative people. That's what you got to do. And just, just claim it, just claim it. That's important, you know, and just start putting it out there, you know. Yes. I saw something about, um, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I love George Orwell. Yeah, no. Nah. Well, Orwell's a big influence on me. It's Orwell who said everything is political. That's one of my favorite quotes. Um, Emily's, Emily's networking out there. Go, Emily. We're wrapping it up? Okay, cool. Well, thank y'all so much. I'm going to go out there and sign books. And um, just thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. And let's eat.